Welcome, Dr. Epic here, and today we're going to discuss the American collapse of the Great Depression. And along the way, we're going to learn what an economy actually is. We're going to feel the presence of the animal spirits. We're going to see the formation of a huge new American desert, witness the rise of the Louisiana kingfish, crush the bonus army, and meet the four men who would rule America. We're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box. So put that in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that's about to follow as we learn all about the Great Depression. Okay, what was the Great Depression? Now, the Great Depression, all caps, the Great Depression was, at its most basic, the near total failure of the entire American economy between 1929 and 1939. It impoverished nearly everyone and left the country much, much poorer than they were before. It shook the political foundation of the nation, and it was the most significant existential crisis of the United States since the days of the Civil War. Quite simply, during the Great Depression, the entire country almost collapsed into dictatorship, anarchy, and war. And the traditional historical view of the Great Depression was that the 1920s were not really a period of economic growth, not sustained real economic growth but just a period of wild speculation and inflation. The jazz and liquor parties of the Roaring Twenties ended with the economic crash of 1929. And this was followed by a long period of economic collapse and decline. And the Great Depression represented the failure of wild, unrestrained capitalism, followed by much more realistic plans for economic growth. And in this traditional view, in the depths of the Great Depression, a new hero president emerged, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR himself. And he saved the country through strong leadership and a broad program of economic plans, collectively called the New Deal. And in this telling, FDR and his New Deal saved the country and rescued it from the Great Depression. But, 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 but. This narrative has come under considerable attack, under considerable criticism by Frederick Hayek, Milton Friedman, Amity Schles, and in both historical and economic circles, it remains a spirited economic debate among both economists and historians. Some claim that the New Deal essentially failed. It essentially failed to solve the problems of the Great Depression, and it might have actually deepened, intensified, and lengthened the crisis. And in this kind of counter-narrative, Far from saving America, FDR's New Deal might have come close to killing it altogether. Why does it matter? Now, studying the Great Depression matters for two reasons. One, it really was the largest existential crisis in American history, only behind the Civil War itself. The United States almost did crack completely apart. And you had these, these incredible things happen during the Great Depression. Down in Louisiana, Louisiana saw the essential failure of democracy as the entire state was taken over by what can only be described uh, as a socialist dictator in the form of Huey Long. And on the streets of Washington, D.C. itself, you had the battles of the Bonus Army, in which the U.S. Army, with tanks and tear gas and cavalry, actually battled World War I veterans in front of the U.S. Capitol. There were literally tanks on the street. And you know what? Don't take my word for it. This was actually the opinion of Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. He described America as being on the brink of political collapse. And he attributed this to two of the most dangerous men in America. His words. One of them was Huey Long, the dictator of Louisiana. The other was General Douglas MacArthur. And around the figure of Douglas MacArthur, there were all sorts of rumors that he was being prepared to take military control of the United States and become the military dictator after suspending democracy and suspending the Constitution itself. Why does it matter? Secondly, that the economic institutions and financial organizations that were set up in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s were designed to do nothing but prevent a second Great Depression. This includes the Security and Exchange Commission, which was established in 1934, the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which was set up in 1933, and FDR completely reorganizes the Federal Reserve System. And all of these financial institutions, all of these economic organizations were designed to do nothing but prevent 
another huge economic catastrophe. And they've worked pretty well. Only a couple times since then has economic problems really brought a major, major crisis. Uh, and one of, the, one of the times that these institutions failed was in the 1970s during a period uh, called stagflation. And what happened in the 1970s is that the economy was completely stagnant, but inflation continued to rise since you know, it was a period of economic stagnation and inflation at the same time, stagflation. And indeed, uh, Jimmy Carter ultimately completely botched the federal response to stagflation, which is one of the reasons that he and his party were defeated so decisively at the end of the 1970s. And again, these institutions are not working as well as they used to. And this is one of the reasons that led to the Great Recession of 2006 to 2016. Even though, to be honest, those dates are highly, highly debated. And even more debated is the role of the federal government when it responded to the Great Recession. Was, was the federal government able to use these institutions to stimulate rapid economic growth? And the answer is no. We had almost a decade of little to no economic growth, and it remains an open debate. Did Barack Obama botch the Great Recession in the same way that Jimmy Carter botched stagflation in the 1970s? And even more concerning, these economic organizations and financial institutions are working less and less well every year that goes by. And there are many economists who say we are on the verge of a second Great Depression. And it is not a question of if, only a matter of when this occurs. So the manner in which the Great Depression happened, historically, it, it affects how Americans attempt to manage the economy in the present day. And since historians and economists cannot agree on what actually happened during the Great Depression, this creates a great deal of, of uncertainty in our current attempts to prevent a second uh, Great Depression. And, and this is the question, you know, did the New Deal of FDR save the country from the Depression or did it make things worse? Uh, because these are the same kind of policies that leaders attempt to implement today or will be implementing very soon. When there is an economic recession, what should the government do? Should they borrow a ton of money and increase government spending and launch these huge stimulus plans? Should they cut taxes and borrow a ton of money to keep the government afloat? Should they announce these huge sweeping you know, programs and try to create a, a type of command economy? And are they correct in doing any of that? These are open questions that, frankly, nobody has 100% certain answers to. So let's actually talk about what, let's talk about some fundamental ideas here. For starters, what is an economy? Okay. An economy is, all caps, an economy is, at its most basic definition, the collective system of production, distribution, and consumption that determines the scale and degree of material inequality. There has never been such a thing as an egalitarian human society. All human societies have an economic system, which determines who gets fed and who does not. And there are many different types of economies. You have the old feudal economies of the Middle Ages in which serfs produced food and passed this food on to the nobility and the church, which then protected them from outside uh, threats. You have you know, the command economies of the old Soviet Union in which the government simply told you how many things you were going to produce and how much you could sell them by. Or there are prestige economies in which you have these these completely autarkous units that simply trade preciosities and treasure, but are ultimately, you know, economically independent. So there's many, many different types of economies. Most of the modern world operates within a market economy, within a capitalist economy, where value is determined by changes in supply and demand. Objects in short supply and high demand will be worth a lot. Objects in large supply and low demand will be worth very little. Let's take peaches. If there are a lot of peaches growing on every tree on every city block and nobody really wants peaches, then the price of peaches will be very, very low. On the other hand, if there's only like four or five trees in the entire country that produce peaches and everyone decides that they really, really want peaches, then the price of an individual peach will be very, very high. Everything circulates along the curves of supply and demand. Value is expressed in price. 
the actual number of the units of currency that are being exchanged, dollars or Deutschmarks or cigarettes or whatever. Thus, a market economy uses currency to reflect the value of everything within it. Land, labor, and capital are mostly fungible, which is to say they are mostly capable of being bought and sold. Now, according to the great historian John Maynard Keynes, the great demand was largely caused by a lack of demand. People were scared by the failure of the banks and the downturn in the economy. Hence, they hoarded money instead of investing it, instead of spending it. And this fear of losing their money pulled money out of the economy and caused a spiral of economic decline. And that, in turn, caused greater panic, which pulled more money of the, out of the economy, which in turn caused even greater panic. Thus, an economy is not driven by people's rational economic decisions, but rather by their animal spirits. This was one of Keynes' big revelations, is that eco economic decisions are not made rationally or morally. They're made, ultimately, by fear and pride and things like that, by people's base, raw emotions. So, to solve an economic downturn, the government must reassure consumers by pouring money back into the economy. According to John Maynard Keynes, the government should then borrow and then spend vast sums of money and then return that money to the economy through planned programs of growth. This large-scale planning then reassures people it calms their animal spirits. And it tells them that someone is taking control, someone is in, someone is taking a leadership role, someone is planning the economy, and this will calm them down and reinvigorate demand. Thus, you have this really famous quote by John Maynard Keynes. The markets are moved by animal spirits, not by reason. But again, people disagree with him. Others disagreed strongly. According to other economists like uh, Frederick Hayek or Milton Friedman, this was the complete opposite of what you should do. They argue that the Great Depression had nothing to do with demand. They argue that the Great Depression was mostly caused by a contraction in the monetary supply. It wasn't that people were pulling money out of the system. It was that there wasn't enough money in the system to begin with. And that bank failures uh, during the Depression destroyed faith in the currency, and it triggered even more people to withdraw from the economy, thus triggering a massive deflation of the currency. Now, what, uh, what uh, Friedman and Hayek argue is that by pulling money out of the system through taxation and borrowing, the federal government pulls more money out of the economic system, which causes even greater economic damage. The Depression was just another cyclical downturn, but it was inept government policy that made the Depression great. So, in the face of an economic downturn, in the face of an economic recession, you should not listen to John Maynard Keynes. The government should reduce taxes and then borrow less, thus leaving the value of money to freely adjust itself. And anything else is just theft. Anything else is just governmental theft. Because if the government starts spending money and starts deciding who is going to receive money, it inevitably leads to a corrupt and incompetent government. Thus, this very famous quote by uh, Frederick Hayek, the history of government management of money has, except for a few short happy periods, been one of incessant fraud and deception. These two economic theories are incompatible. Here we have John Maynard Keynes' opinion summarized here. The government can cure economic recessions by borrowing money and spending it to increase demand. So according to John Maynard Keynes, the New Deal worked. No, says Frederick Hayek. And here's his opinion summarized here. The government can cure economic recessions by taxing less and borrowing less, and thus stimulating consumption. Because according to Frederick Hayek, the New Deal failed. And this brings us to our big question, the big question we're going to address here. So put this question down and be thinking about this question as we move through the historical events of the period. Did the New Deal save America? Using the historical events between 1929 and 1939, evaluate the success of FDR's New Deal, both economically and politically. Did the New Deal reverse the damage of the Great Depression, or did it lengthen and deepen the crisis? What would be the opinions of Keynes or Hayek? 
was the New Deal necessary to get the country through the 1930s? Did that thing above my head, did it actually work? Did the New Deal work? Okay, let's actually talk about the historical events, the Great Depression. Now, in a nutshell, the Great Depression was basically a farming crisis that turned into a banking crisis, that turned into a monetary crisis, that turned into an overall economic crisis. And the origins of the Great Depression began in the early 1920s with this farming crisis, with these little small farming towns scattered across the country. Now, during the Great War, during World War I, banks and the government had encouraged farmers to borrow a lot of money and greatly expand production. Farms across the country, even little bitty ones, accumulated substantial debt buying tractors and pesticides and fertilizers and, you know, renting and, and clearing land. Uh, during these sort of windfall agricultural years of, of the Great War, as Europe purchased large amounts of American foodstuffs. But in the 1920s, as European agriculture recovered from World War I, Europeans not only stopped buying American food, Europeans actually began to sell their own crops on the world market. So these European nations went from consumers to competitors, and the result was a collapse in farm prices. Prices tumbled. The price of corn fell by 63%. The price of wheat fell by 52%. Farming incomes collapsed by two-thirds. But, but, all these American farms still owed all this money that they had borrowed. And small, they couldn't pay the debts. So small town banks started foreclosing on family farms. I mean, look at that chart on the lower left. That is the rate of farm foreclosure throughout the 1920s. And the banks would seize these farms and then try to resell them, but no one's gonna buy these itty bitty little farms because farm incomes have fallen by two thirds. Who would be a farmer in this environment? The farms were essentially worthless. The banks themselves began to fail because they owned so many worthless farms. Between 1920 and 1929, more than 200 rural banks failed. And as banks at the time were not required to carry insurance, when a bank failed, uh, it often took the entire savings of its customers with it. So you have a small town with one little bank in the center, that bank folds, the entire town savings are gone. But banks exist within a banking system. Little banks are tied into big banks and they're all tied into each other. And the bank system is constantly lending money and moving currency back and forth between little banks and big banks and between big banks and big banks and between little banks. So as this wave of bank failures begins to cross the countryside, all of this debt starts to move from failed bank to another bank. And then that bank will fail. And then the accumulated debt will eventually move into the big banks in the big cities. And this wave of debt begins to affect the big banks in the big cities. All of that debt moved from the small banks to the big banks. And these banks began carrying a lot of debt, like a lot of debt. People started to react in two ways to all of this debt suddenly accumulating in their bank. One, they just started to pull their money out of the bank. They would quietly go in on a Thursday afternoon, take all of their money out of the bank, and then either put it under their mattress or put it in a box and bury it in the backyard. Or the second thing they would do is that there was one place to stick money that seemed completely safe at the time, especially given the booming economy of the 1920s. And that place was the New York Stock Exchange, the stock market. And in fact, the stock market was going crazy in the 1920s. It was seen as something that was much, much safer than banks. In fact, it's something that banks themselves saw. They saw the stock market as being safer than other banks. So much so that the banks saw investing in the stock market as a way to sort of release themselves from all this debt that they had accumulated. So the banks start playing the stock market and people start playing the stock market. But the whole time they're playing the stock market and they're investing all of this money in the stock market, the amount of money in circulation is slowly dropping. Liquidity, which is the flexibility of any economic system, is declining. The whole system was growing, but it was growing much more brittle as it went on. Now, the president for the 1920s was, of course, Calvin Coolidge. And Calvin Coolidge was really quite popular. But after the death of his youngest son, Coolidge wanted nothing to do with politics, even though he probably could have won an unprecedented third election in 1928. He retires. Coolidge says, I'm out. And he refuses to run for president in 1928. And instead, Calvin Coolidge backs his protege, this very popular man who was the Secretary of Commerce, and his name is Herbert Hoover. 
All caps, Herbert Hoover. Now, Herbert Hoover was widely regarded as one of the most intelligent and capable men in politics. He was a former mining engineer. Everybody really liked Herbert Hoover. With the blessing of Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover decides to make a run for the White House. And in the election of 1928, Herbert Hoover wins a massive, massive victory. It's a landslide for the Republicans as they win every state from Washington to California to Texas to Florida uh, to Maine. Uh, they win 58% of the popular vote. And Herbert Hoover, along with his uh, vice president, Native American uh, Charles Curtis, enter the White House as one of the most popular incoming presidents in American history. But seven months into the presidency of Herbert Hoover, disaster strikes. And that is Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. The entire stock market collapses. The New York Stock Exchange loses 23% of its value in two days. And in fact, by the end of December, the value of the New York Stock Exchange has fallen by half. And indeed, in the next three years, the stock value loses 89% of its 1929 value. Many stock traders and businessmen were completely and totally ruined by the collapse of the New York Stock Exchange mostly because they had relied on a practice called margin trading. Now, margin trading, uh, it's highly regulated today, but margin trading is when a trader uses collateral, which is his own personal wealth, his own savings, his own car, his own house, to borrow money to buy stock. Hence, they only own a margin of the stock they actually purchased. And the bet is, the bet is that the stock will increase in value and then they'll sell it and that will allow the trader to pay off the debt and not have his house or his car seized by the bank. But if the value, if the stock falls in value, then that trader has just lost everything. And in 1929, absolutely everyone lost everything which is why you have scores of suicides after Black Tuesday. Between October and January of uh, 1930, there's over 44 suicides where, you know, stock traders simply open the windows of a 20 or 30th story building and jump because they've lost everything. And it gets even worse because in an attempt to offload debt left over from the farming crisis of the 1920s, many American banks had invested money in the stock market. They were hoping that stocks would rise and allow them to pay off all of that farming debt left over from the 1920s. But as the stock market failed, not only did that not pay off all of that debt, banks incurred even greater levels of debt. What used to be scores of banks going under became hundreds of banks failing across the United States. These banks began to go out of business and they often took all of the people who had invested money in the bank, all that money is vanished. People who didn't invest in the stock market. People who had nothing to do with all of these crazy business risks. People that had just worked hard and saved money found themselves completely ruined. The banks collapsed and took all of the savings with them. People ran to get their money out of the banks before the banks went out of business. This is called a bank run. And people pulled their money out of the banks as quickly as they could. And in the photograph right above, that is a line of people rushing to get their money out of the bank before the bank fails. Now, once people lose crisis in the banking system, people rush to pull their money out of the banks, and that will in fact cause the bank to fail. Hence, bank runs, bank runs become these kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. And this caused even more banks to fail, even banks that had nothing to do with the stock market. And this began to affect really big banks, like really big banks, such as the Massive Bank of United States, which collapsed on uh, December 10th, 1931. People rushed to get their money out of the bank as quickly as they could. They tried to get their money out of the bank before it failed, but they didn't all do it. And when the Bank of United States failed, it still had $160 million on the books. And all that money, poof, it's gone. And most of that money didn't belong to stock traders or big banks. Most of it belonged to just working class families. Most of it belonged to just small businesses, mom and pop grocery stores. Hence, you have the tragedy of, of cartoons like this, where you have a man who is living on a park bench in the park. And a squirrel goes up to him and says, but why didn't you save some money for the future back when times were good? And the man living on the park bench says, I did because he's a victim of bank failure. 
he didn't play the stock market. He didn't engage in all this risky margin trading. He put his money in the bank and thought it was safe. And then his bank went out of business. Businesses, both large and small, began to fail across the United States. They couldn't pay their workers. They couldn't pay their employees. They couldn't obtain loans to get them through as all the banks were failing. And people are pulling their money out of the economy altogether. And all of these banks and all of these businesses are just collapsing across the United States. And unemployment began to soar as people were out of work. It hit 15%, then it hit 20%, and then it went beyond 20% unemployment, soaring to levels unknown at any other period in American history. I mean, look at this poor guy walking with a placard. And on his placard, he's looking for a job. And it says, I know three languages. I know three trades. I fought for three years. I have three children and no work for three months. And he only wants one job. Unemployment was massive. There were no businesses. No one was hiring. Entire towns began to put up signs. Jobless men keep going. We can't even take care of our own. People carrying placards, begging for work. But there was no, there's no work to be found. Herbert Hoover acted. And he based his response on three things. One, a balanced federal budget that included large-scale public works projects. Two, he decided to protect American industry from foreign competition. And three, by keeping prices stable and maintaining a tight control over the money supply. Now, these new big public works projects were designed to employ people in this time of need. And this included a massive new dam on the Colorado River. This would be a true wonder of engineering. Much later, it would be known you know, as Hoover Dam. Yet, Hoover's commitment to a balanced budget required him to raise taxes as, as well as he spent money. So Hoover then raised income taxes from Coolidge's low income taxes of 25% to a new high of 63%. And before I talk about like what a terrible idea that was, I, I do got to give Herbert Hoover props. Um, Hoover Dam really is like spectacular. If you've ever been to Southern Nevada, I mean, Hoover Dam is just like one of the engineering wonders of the world. But let's go back to 1920. Let's go back to 1930. The thing you need to understand is every time the government raises taxes, that actually decreases economic activity. Raising taxes pulls money out of the economy and it slows overall economic growth. So the weakened economy is already wobbling and then Herbert Hoover doubles income taxes, smashing it way down. And then to protect American industry, Herbert Hoover proceeds to raise taxes again against the advice of virtually all of his advisors. I mean, Andrew Mellon ultimately resigns. Hoover passes something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. There it is, all caps, so you know it's important. Now, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff placed massive new taxes on imported goods. Now, Hoover wanted to protect American business against foreign competition. But with the tariff, he merely pulled even more money out of the economy and then ignited a trade war with like half the countries on the planet. And some of these tariffs were massive. Some of them were like 50% tax. Lastly, the third thing Hoover did was that in trying to keep prices stable, he maintained a tight control over the money supply. Hoover refused to inject more currency into the market. High taxes were pulling money out of the economy. The Smoot-Hawley tariff was pulling money out of the economy. And then you have all of these bank failures and this money is simply vanishing. And people were literally not putting their money in banks. If they had any money, they would put it under their mattress or buried in their backyard. The entire money supply began to collapse. You can see the liquidity in the system is just falling. And in fact, large parts of the country found themselves with no money at all, reduced to a primitive barter economy. And the economy was wobbling with one tax and another tax, and then the restriction in the monetary supply. The entire American economy imploded. The gross domestic product, the quantification of economic activity, fell by a third. Unemployment surged up to 25%. And in some parts of the country, like New York City, unemployment reached 50%. As the economy completely collapsed, money became harder and harder to find. And again, large parts of the country re were reduced to primitive barter exchange because no one had any money. I mean, look at the grocery store right up above my head. 
You don't need money. What have you got? We will take anything. So you walk into the grocery store with a sewing machine or a car and you see what you can bargain with it. There's farm workers there on the lower left. They're being paid in vegetables because the farm has no actual money. Those guys, those guys on the left, they're being paid in potatoes and they're going to take those potatoes to the grocery store and exchange like half their potatoes for maybe a bit of meat or an onion or some carrots. And these guys are the lucky ones. They have a job. And there we go. Look at this ad in the newspaper right up above my little yellow box. We'll exchange good painting for new teeth. It's, some, it's an artist looking to offload some paintings in return for dental work because no one has any money. The middle class in the United States was virtually annihilated. The working class itself was pressed into, dis, into uh, destitution. As unemployment soared, wages collapsed. In 1932, people made a third of less than what they made in 1929. And that is even if they had a job. So the entire economy is in the process of completely imploding. And people are like, how can this get worse? How can this get any worse? And then the drought came. A massive drought then sweeps across the food producing portions of the American West, with some areas experiencing a loss of 50% or more in rainfall. Look at those areas. Those are severely hit drought areas. This becomes known as the Great Drought of the 1930s. And even in a time of economic prosperity, the Great Drought of the 30s would have been a really major crisis in good and prosperous times. But during the Great Depression, the Great Drought was deadly. It was absolutely deadly. But it gets worse because decades of poor soil management across the American West resulted in long-term damage to the topsoil. So when the soil damage was combined with severe drought, it turned all of that prosperous farmland into something else, into something much more horrible. It created a vast new American desert in the middle of the country. The extreme desertification of much of America's prime farmland with huge dust storms, which would actually spread the desert out from the worst hit areas, it affected more than a quarter of the country. A fourth of the United States turned into a desert. And this huge new desert acquired an ominous name, the Dust Bowl. And this new desert stretched all the way from Texas to North Dakota, right across the prime farmland of Kansas and Nebraska. And photographs of the Dust Bowl are absolutely terrifying. Uh, I believe this is a town in western Oklahoma. Literally, they, they can see the desert approaching them. These huge dust storms rolling across prime farmland, turning rich cornfields into lifeless deserts. People fled the Dust Bowl by the thousands. Dust Bowl refugees fled this new American desert, joining long lines of unemployed men who crisscrossed the nation looking for work. People hoped that wherever they ended up, it had to be better than what they left behind. And these Dust Bowl refugees, these, these wandering unemployed men, these hobos and drifters, they all gathered together in these huge shanty towns that were located outside of virtually every big American town and outside of every big American city. These horrible, depressing shanty towns that became known as Hoovervilles. And here is one of the Hoovervilles. I believe this one's outside St. Louis. Literally, people that are destitute, hungry, looking for any kind of work, throwing together shacks you know, of whatever materials they could find. And people, for the most part, left these Hoover town, Hoovervilles alone. They felt sorry for the people. And again, who are they gonna, who, how are they going to clear the Hooverville? they got to pay somebody to do it, and there's no money. And life inside one of these Hoovervilles was bad. It can only be imagined what life inside one of the Hoovervilles was like. You would basically wake up in the morning, wander into the city looking for work, hoping that someone could give you a... You could pick potatoes that day, or that you could get some jobs washing dishes, or get, do a little bit of construction work. And if you were lucky, you'd get a little bit of food, or, you know, a sack of potatoes, and go back to your Hooverville and, and try to trade it for some other services or maybe a little bit of meat or onion. And if you couldn't find work, 
you know, you just kind of did the best you can. You worked on your Hooverville. These places, of course, had no plumbing. They had no electricity. And entire families moved into these Hoovervilles. And Americans began to starve. And you see a lot of photographs of these men from the 1930s, like that guy on the upper left who is just looking for work. And you notice that these people are thin because they are slowly starving to death. Uh, and indeed, it's been said that there are only nine meals between civilization and anarchy because that's all it takes. You miss three or four days without food and you start thinking wild thoughts. You start following anybody who is going to promise you a job or give you a square meal. And really weird stories come out of this period in American history. The city of Chicago itself couldn't rely on the government. The starving people of Chicago couldn't rely on the city of Chicago. But the, the, the organization that stepped up to feed Chicago was the Italian Mafia. If you look at that picture on the upper right, that is Al Capone's soup kitchen. The Mafia opened up free soup kitchens for people. You stand in line for an hour or two, you get a bowl of soup, a hunk of bread, a glass of water, and if you're lucky, a cup of coffee for a dessert. Al Capone fed the city of Chicago during the worst of the Great Depression. But Father Divine fed New York City. And Father Divine is a really interesting character. Father Divine was in Harlem, and that's Father Divine in the upper left. Father Divine uh, was this head of this congregation. Some people called it a cult. And Father Divine believed that God spoke to him. And Father Divine had a vision from God that said, feed the starving people of New York. And Father Divine gathered together the kitchens of Harlem and threw them open to the starving people of New York City. And Father Divine held these massive banquets, feeding thousands and thousands of people in a single meal. And Father Divine basically had this very unusual approach to the ugly racism of his day. Because Father Divine said, we're going to kill racism in America through kindness. We're going to feed people and show them that we are all the same. We're going to defeat American racism by loving it to death, by hugging it to death in a spirit of true Christian brotherhood. And in this way, Father Divine is seen as kind of this precursor to uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and indeed, one of the odder things of the Great Depression is that race relations actually got better during the Great Depression. Because before, you know, in 1922, you'd have, you know, this white dude and a black dude and a Russian immigrant and an Italian American, and they'd all cut each other's throat for a construction job or a job in a steel mill. But by the time you get to 1932, no one has anything. Everyone is reduced to Zippo, zero. And they all find themselves sitting in a bench at Father Divine's congregation, and he's feeding them all. Race relations in America get better during the Great Depression. But not every city had, you know, the Italian mafia to feed them. Not every city had Father Divine to save them. The despair was real, and people began to do very, very extreme things, like sell their own children. Hoover was the guy in charge. Hoover was president, and Hoover got the blame. They called these shanty towns Hoovervilles. You look at those little kids right up above me, Hoover's Poor Farm Tobacco Fund. Hard times are still hoovering over us. Everyone blamed Hoover. And that's a good question. And I want you to think about this, cogitate on this. Does Hoover actually deserve all this blame? Hoover has gone down in history as one of the worst presidents in American history. Does he deserve all of this opprobrium? Why? Why does he deserve it? Or why not? I mean, he certainly couldn't have foreseen the great drought. I mean, he didn't control the weather. And as economic conditions worsened, Herbert Hoover begins to isolate himself. He doesn't really understand what's going on in America itself. He begins to surround himself with a series of yes men. He's just telling people, it's just a bad time. It's a bad quarter hour, and we just need to get through it. My policies will work. You just give them time. Yes, I understand people are starving to death, but, but th things will recover very, very soon. And as his policies are not working, and as things are getting worse and worse, Hoover 
Hoover kind of checks out. People will deliver him like really bad news on a Wednesday and he'll sit there and nod and then just say, I'm going to take a four day vacation. Hoover spends most of his last year as president fishing. All right. People will give him bad news and he'll take off on a Thursday and fish Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come back Monday, sit down and say, okay, I'm the president. I don't want to hear any more bad news. All right, what's happening? And they're like, well, President Hoover, um, a socialist dictator has taken over Louisiana. This is Huey Long, the kingfish. He is governor of Louisiana between 1928 and 1932. And then he basically appoints himself as a U.S. senator between 1932 and 1935. So for basically, you know, seven years... He runs Louisiana like it is his own personal little kingdom. And with the vacuum in leadership produced by Herbert Hoover, who's off fishing, uh, several figures step in. And one of them was, you know, Huey Long, the kingfish. In 1928, Huey Long puts together something that the South had never seen before, which is a multiracial coalition of poor white and poor blacks. And he puts them together. He says, the rich white families of New Orleans and Baton Rouge are screwing all of you. Vote for me and I will put them in their place. And he builds this multiracial coalition and he wins the governorship. And there he campaigns on a platform of wealth redistribution. And it later becomes known as the Share the Wealth program. He aims at seizing any personal fortune over $100 million. He aims at a 100% income tax on anybody making more than a million dollars a year. And Huey Long is massively popular inside of the United States. And as governor, Huey Long placed massive new taxes on the oil companies drilling for oil in Louisiana. And with all this revenue, Long launched massive public works projects, paving roads. He built the country's largest state capital. He gave free school lunches to all poor children in the state. No children starved in Depression-era Louisiana. He built universities. He built colleges. He built most of Louisiana State University. But Huey Long was a ruthless politician. Huey Long was a ruthless governor. He arrested his political opponents. He arrested his own lieutenant governor. He was not above using state police to bully opponents. He was not above using state funds to buy election offices. By 1932, Huey Long had effectively become the dictator of Louisiana. And he had effectively shut down democracy in that state. And Huey Long drew up plans to become the president of the United States. And Huey Long had received a ton of death threats. So he surrounded himself with a massive group of heavily armed bodyguards. Men in uniforms would carrying 45s, shotguns, and Tommy guns. And Huey Long nicknamed this massive bodyguard the Skull Crushers. And that's them in the upper left. But Huey Long wasn't alone. He was only one of four men who wanted to rule the United States. The second was Father Coughlin. That's Father Coughlin right there. Father Coughlin was an intensely popular uh, Catholic priest who began a radio show in 1926 Michigan, denouncing racism in America, denouncing the Ku Klux Klan, offering spiritual guidance to people swept up in the Depression. And indeed, Father Coughlin moved into politics, starting a magazine called Social Justice. Indeed, Father Coughlin popularized the phrase social justice. And Father Coughlin's show became incredibly popular as Father Coughlin discovered who really caused all of America's economic problems. Because Father Coughlin had figured out it was the Jews. American Jews had created all of this economic chaos. It was the Jews that were trying to destroy America. And Father Coughlin made some very, very interesting friends. Because Father Coughlin made good friends with the Nazis, including American Nazis who would stand in these rallies and give the Nazi salute to both the American flag and the German swastika. And indeed, you can see in that cartoon on the lower left, that's a cartoon by Dr. Seuss himself, in which Hitler calls Father Coughlin asking him to publish social justice in German. Now we come to the unfortunate events of the Bonus Army. Now, that is the Bonus Army. What was the Bonus Army? The Bonus Army was an organization of veterans from World War I. Now, back in 1924, the Congress had awarded them uh, generous veterans pensions, but the pensions were not to be awarded until the year 1945. But the problem is, is that almost all of these veterans were out of work. 
almost all of these veterans were hungry. They needed the money now. So the bonus army marched on Washington, and hence the veterans began to demand the early release of that pension fund, if only at a fraction of its value. And in 1932, they went to Congress to ask for the release of those pension funds because they needed work now. They didn't need work in 1945. And they stand in front of the Capitol. They sing patriotic songs. They get one of the most decorated veterans in American history, a guy called Smedley Butler. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor twice. He, they, they say the Pledge of Allegiance. They sing patriotic songs. They say, we have served our country. We need an early release of those, of those veterans' pensions. We need the money now. President Hoover called them all a bunch of communists and radicals, and he ordered the U.S. Army to disperse them. Using tanks and tear gas, the U.S. Army attacked these World War I veterans. They descended on the veterans. They gassed them. They beat them. They arrested them. They killed two of them. And the bonus army is absolutely and ruthlessly crushed in front of the U.S. Capitol. And the man leading the attack on the bonus army was General Douglas MacArthur, himself a veteran of World War I. And Douglas MacArthur is a really interesting figure. He is one of the youngest generals in American history. And, you know, he's a World War I hero himself. Douglas MacArthur commanded the attack on the bonus army. And MacArthur was seen as like the greatest military mind since Robert E. Lee. Everyone acknowledged that Douglas MacArthur is legitimately a military genius. And Douglas MacArthur's biggest fan was Douglas MacArthur. He had a massive, massive ego. And his brutal suppression of the bonus army is celebrated in certain circles. And people begin to think that the crisis is so bad and President Hoover is off fishing somewhere that maybe what the country needs is not a president, but a general. Maybe the country needs strong military leadership. And this creates a series of rumors. There are, to this day, a series of rumors surrounding Douglas MacArthur in the early 1930s, in which, you know, the rumor is that a series of businessmen began to talk amongst themselves with and to discuss the possibility that Douglas MacArthur could use the military to seize control of the United States, suspend democracy, suspend the Constitution until the crisis was over. And these rumors actually reached FDR himself. And we have in the historical record where, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is talking about, you know, these rumors that business leaders, old robber barons, head of corporations, heads of banks are saying, maybe we can get Douglas MacArthur to seize control of the United States. And Roosevelt believed a lot of these rumors, which is why he called Douglas MacArthur one of the two most dangerous men in America. And finally, we come to number four, FDR himself, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Lastly, there is the popular governor of New York, FDR. Now he's Theodore Roosevelt's second cousin. And unlike Theodore Roosevelt, FDR was a Democrat and he had served in the administration of Woodrow Wilson. Indeed, he'd greatly admired Woodrow Wilson and he had been on the Democratic ticket in 1920. However, in 1921, FDR had contracted uh, polio. And most Democrats at this point wrote him off. Uh, they wrote him off uh, as a helpless cripple. His political career is over. Nobody is going to vote for a guy that's paralyzed. Yet he returned. And in 1924, FDR uh, led the fight against the KKK's attempted takeover of the Democratic Party that year. And Roosevelt carefully concealed the extent of his disease, not thinking that people would support him if they knew he was partially paralyzed. Indeed, that right there on the left, that's one of the few photographs we have of FDR in a wheelchair. Often he places himself in a car or he's seen seated behind a desk, or sometimes they would inject him with like powerful painkillers and lock him into this steel frame that he would wear underneath his clothing so that he could stand for short periods. FDR is elected governor of New York in 1929, and he's one of the very few politicians to recognize the scale of the economic catastrophe in front of him. And FDR moves quite rapidly as the governor of New York. He implements many of the recommendations of this radical new economist, John Maynard Keynes. FDR begins weekly radio addresses, his famous 
fireside chats where he details what he did that week, what he's going to do next week. And the point of these, these broadcasts is to calm people down. And FDR institutes a huge work program for the unemployed, and he pays for it by borrowing massive amounts of money, exactly like Keynes said, to, you know, to stimulate demand. And they're gearing up for the election of 1932. And FDR is priming himself to challenge Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover, even though he's spent most of the last year fishing, thinks he can, he can win re-election. After all, I mean, this was the election of 1928. You know, Herbert Hoover won 58% of the popular vote. He won all of those red states. And he's thinking, I can just duplicate even part of that and I can win the election. But Herbert Hoover vastly, vastly underestimated the scale of the American catastrophe unfolding in front of him. And this is the result of the election of 1932 because FDR paints the map blue. He wins a huge electoral victory. He utterly and completely defeats Herbert Hoover and he becomes the president of the United States. And he begins to implement his plan to save the country and he will call it the New Deal. And we'll get into the New Deal later and we'll address that question on the lower left. But we're gonna do that next time. And I will see you there.